that we rely upon the precepts. We rely upon suffering teaching us some important things. Opening the compassion that is naturally stored up in our hearts. We also rely upon the three treasures. We take refuge in them over and over and over again in our practice so that we're ready for this kind of horrific event. They're called the three treasures or the three jewels. It's interesting that in, in times of disaster when everything is swept away, people often carry currency in the form of gold or jewels, jewels sewn into their clothing. There's an old story from the Lotus Sutra about it's the Buddhist equivalent of the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter. Where the prodigal son wanders away from home, but doesn't know that there are jewels sewed into the lining of his coat. He becomes poor, like in the Bible, lives with swine, eats on garbage heaps with pigs and so on, wanders around miserable, not knowing that the jewel is right right next to their heart at night, in their clothing. So those jewels are the three treasures, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Because like jewels, they are valuable, ultimately valuable in all places, in all situations, in all times, in all cultures. We rely upon the Sangha, upon each other, the web makes us all witnesses to this event. We can't ignore what's going on. We become one worldwide Sangha watching, suffering. The world becomes a Sangha, people coming together to rescue, to donate, to send aid, to mourn, to talk, to console each other, to ponder what is best to do, to take this reality, this new reality in, and practice with it. We rely upon the Dharma, the teachings of the fundamental truth. When the Buddha was dying and people were mourning around him, some of his disciples were mourning, some of his disciples were had equanimity, some of the gathered devas, spirits, were mourning and distressed, and others were had equanimity and calmness in the face of the Buddha's death. And one disciple in particular, Ananda, the Buddha's cousin, who had been his personal attendant for 35 years, and who memorized all of the Buddha's teachings, had a prodigious memory, a photographic memory, or phonographic memory, in, that, in this case, phonographic memory, he was hearing and then memorizing. So he had all of the teachings in, in his head, but they hadn't yet penetrated. The reality of them hadn't yet penetrated. So when the Buddha was dying and Ananda realized what was happening, he went into one of the halls where they practiced and was leaning against the doorpost, weeping. And the Buddha noticed that Ananda was gone and asked the other disciples to go and get him, bring him to where the Buddha was lying, dying. And then Buddha said, Ananda, Ananda, why are you weeping? Haven't I told you over and over for 35 years? All compounded things will disappear. All compounded things will fall apart and disperse. So we take refuge in that fact. It's a bizarre thing, isn't it, to take refuge in impermanence. It's not what you can say to people when they say, well, if you don't have God, what do you take refuge in? Well, I take refuge in impermanence. People think you're crazy. But because it's the truth, because it's the underlying truth of all existence, it is a reliable refuge. It is a foundation that's continually changing and disappearing. It's the weirdest kind of foundation that we can stand on. On permanence. To take refuge in impermanence, but it's true, and because it's true, it's a reliable refuge. We can see its truth on our screens, things that we thought were permanent, houses, house after house, crumbling, crushed like balsa wood. 
An entire university swept away. Whole villages gone. 10,000 people unaccounted for, maybe more. Maybe forever gone, maybe swept out to sea and will never come back. When we see that, suddenly we see the truth of impermanence. We can't deny it. We can't blame anyone, even a divine power for it. It's the truth of impermanence. All constructed or compounded things. Whether it's a house or a human body. Buddha said, this, this bag of, of rice and gruel, <laughs> we're compounded out of rice, gruel, a skin bag, thoughts and emotions. All of it, all of it will fall apart eventually. So right now, can you be aware of impermanence? How are you aware right now of impermanence? When we truly practice awareness of impermanence, it doesn't make us depressed. It makes us truly alive. Moment after moment, moment after moment, truly alive as each moment passes into the next, disperses and passes into the next. This moment and the next, everything is alive. And everything becomes so precious. The other aspect of seeing this huge scenario of impermanence, everything becomes precious. The one child that they rescue, the one 60-year-old man whom they found floating on the top of his house out at sea, that's reporting on because that's so precious, that one 60-year-old man who was rescued. When we're really awake and alive to the truth of impermanence, everything is precious in its very impermanence. The Japanese have this wonderful habit or custom of when somebody, when you say goodbye to someone when they're leaving, you like here, if a, if a car leaves, you wave until you can't see them anymore and they can't see you anymore. And the idea is you may never see them again. So it's a recognition of the truth of impermanence. When we do this as a mindfulness task, we, it takes various forms. But one form is, as we're interacting with someone, realize this person could die tonight. And then our leave-taking, even small leave-takings, are very different. Often when someone dies unexpectedly, we think, thank goodness our last interaction was good, was loving, was kind. Or thank goodness we settled that old dispute that was taken care of before they suddenly died. And that's a great consolation to us. So we should remember anybody could die at any time and try to make our partings and our interactions the kind we would like to remember and smile over, be consoled by. This is why the Japanese love cherry blossoms. Not because they're beautiful or they smell nice, but because they are impermanent. Because the beauty evokes something in our hearts and the fragility of their life makes them all the more precious. So it's not just the blossom, but the falling blossom that's treasured in Japan. <coughs> They may be people who are the best prepared for this kind of disaster, not only because they've had them over and over and over again, but because of their awareness of impermanence. So we take refuge in the Sangha, we take refuge in the Dharma, and we take refuge in the Buddha. What does that mean in this case? Well, the Heart Sutra tells us it doesn't mean to take refuge in the Buddha mind in this case. 
Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, this is the Bodhisattva who hears the cries of the world and responds. When deeply practicing prajna paramita, another translation which I like better is when coursing deep in prajna paramita, meaning in deep samadhi, down where that river of deep wisdom, of eternal wisdom flows, touching that eternal boundless river of prajna paramita, wisdom beyond wisdom, clearly saw that all five aggregates are empty and thus relieved all suffering. All five aggregates are empty, not just impermanent, but empty. Form does not differ from emptiness. Emptiness does not differ from form. Form itself is emptiness. How could that be a consolation, that everything is empty? People misunderstand this emptiness. It means, of course, constant change. And permanence, which I already talked about. But it, all, it also means something like a vast storehouse of potential energy. So that when we die, we don't disappear. All of our molecules still exist, and as far as we know, exist forever until this whole cosmos is destroyed. And the calcium on our bodies has existed since the beginning of this universe, and soon after the beginning of this universe, as far as we know. And the hydrogen and the oxygen and the nitrogen, everything that makes up our body goes back to the beginning or almost the beginning of this universe and will exist until this universe is destroyed. And the same is true of all the other energy in our body, our psychic energy, psychological energy, energy of our emotions and so on. But when we die, that's dispersed. But matter is neither created, created nor destroyed. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. We can change the forms of energy. We can change matter into energy. But it's all there. And it all keeps getting reformed into something new. So it disappears as a form. And then it emerges again as something else or many other things. So there's form, and there's emptiness. There's form, and there's emptiness. There's form, and there's emptiness. And if we can open our awareness to how long that has been going on, or close your eyes, and try to open the mind as wide as possible into how long that has been going on, it doesn't matter who or what is doing it, whether God is doing it or it's doing it itself, however, or if cause and effect is making it happen, that doesn't matter. Just watch in your mind's eye, as best you can imagine, the arising of form, the decaying of forms, of how many forms since the beginning of the universe up till now. How many forms just on this earth? How many forms of, let's say, life have arisen, existed for a while, died, decayed, returned into the emptiness of dispersed elements, the potential for something else to arise, and then, through cause and effect, Something else arises, a person, a plant, a dinosaur, a grizzly bear, a fungus, a bacteria, a flower in your garden. So we look at the earth as if looking at it with God's eyes from outer space. And we see all the things that happen on the surface of the earth. Ripples, earthquakes that ripple across its surface, waves that arise small and large from the ocean, come crashing into the land, in some places causing delight in small children, in some places causing devastation. And we watch all the people who have existed since the beginning of 
human beings, how many people have been born, existed for a while, and died, and how many ways have they died? And we can see that this is neither good nor bad. This is beyond good and bad. This is no death and no end to death. No birth and no end to birth. No eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. A million eyes. Millions of eyes and ears and noses and tongues and bodies and minds. Again and again and again, appearing and disappearing, again and again and again. This morning in a memorial service we, we chanted the memorial for one of the old Zen masters, vast ocean of dazzling light, marked by the waves of life and death. Each of us is a wave of life and each of us will recede back into that huge ocean of life, energy, potential energy. So this is the Buddha mind that we can take refuge in too. That all of this, every life, every death is exactly as it should be. Exactly as it should be. And every life will become life again and many lives again. And then we come back to our own individual human being and we mourn the people that we've lost. That's normal. So this is the beauty of our practice, that we hold these incredible truths to be simultaneously true. That our life, each life, is a tiny blip of life on the vast screen of just this universe. That earthquakes are normal. Tsunamis are normal. Deaths of 10,000 people. Births of 10,000 people. Wars. Peace. All of this is normal. This is us. This is our life happening. And at the same time, we grieve for those we've lost. And we grieve with those who have lost their loved ones and were moved to act. So we have wisdom. Always we talk about awakening being a combination of wisdom and compassion. We have wisdom which sees this is normal. This is the way it is. This is the truth. And we have hearts that are moved in compassion. And we cry tears. And we transform those tears through our practice into something beneficial. So please use this opportunity to be awake and to ponder truths beneath the superficial reality of our individual lives. Thank you. <clears throat>